Bathsheba had grown up admiring the handsome, charismatic King David. It had been such an exhilarating time in Israel's history, and her dad, Eliam, was one of David's mighty men, and he had been all wrapped up in the thick of it, close with David ever since that young shepherd had been on the lamb, running away from King Saul. And her grandfather, the godly and spiritual Ahithophel, was one of David's most trusted advisors, whose godly wisdom was deeply valued. What must it have been like for those young families, living in tents, the air crackling with anticipation, watching the mighty men as they gathered around in their recon missions, talking through their strategies? And year after year, these battle-hardened men went to war. And through it all, they managed to consolidate the promised land into the nation of God, ridding the land of Canaanite people groups, always pushing back the Philistines. And it's no surprise that as this young beauty reached maturity, that Bathsheba's father would marry her to another one of the mighty men. This one was David's close friend and a member of his royal guard. His name was Uriah, the Hittite. Now most likely he had converted to Judaism, but certainly he had shown great loyalty to David and to Israel. Now there's no doubt that Bathsheba was able to enjoy being with her husband that first year they were married, because God had instructed all of Israel that if a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. But when the following spring came, all that changed. King David sent his army, including Uriah, with General Joab off to war. But the king stayed home. And one night, David found himself restless. It's not hard to imagine why. Maybe he was bored with nothing to do. Maybe he was lonely without the companionship of his mighty men. So that evening he got up from bed. He'd been taking a nap evidently, and he went for a little stroll on his roof. Now, roofs in David's time, and even to this day in the Middle East, were flat, and they were treated as something like how we treat porches today. Flat roofs provided a place to hang the laundry, to prepare food, to eat, to sleep, to enjoy the cool of the evening. So while David was feeling restless and heading up to the flat roof of his palace, which by the way, oversaw all the city around him because it was built on the highest part of Mount Zion, Bathsheba was preparing to cleanse herself. She had waited till the end of the day to have her bath. And this was a cleansing ritual that was outlined in Leviticus 15, 19 through 30, in which women marked the end of their monthly cycle. Now to get a good close reading of what went down, here is the text. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now our Bible study group questioned the traditional view that Bathsheba was also on her roof if Bathsheba was the godly young woman she's portrayed to be, observing God's word and law for her monthly cleansing, then why would she be in such an exposed area? Even though roofs had a wall all the way around it to prevent people from falling off, it was still kind of public, wasn't it? Is it possible she was in the courtyard of her home or a place even more private than that? It depends on how we read the phrase from the roof. Was David observing from his own roof, or was he observing from someone else's roof? Was Bathsheba taking a full bath, as women in later centuries did, or was she using a pitcher and a bowl, maybe, in some more modest fashion? Either way, Bathsheba would have presumably set up folding screens around her bath that would protect her from view, except, of course, from the one place that could survey what was going on in every home in Jerusalem, the palace above, where no one should have been since all had gone to war. It was a perfect storm. Immediately, Bathsheba's movement must have caught the king's keen and well-trained warrior's eye. She was far enough away that David could be entranced by her beauty without really knowing who she was, so he began asking his servants questions. And he found out this lovely vision was the daughter of one of his mighty men, the intrepid Eliam. 
and he had to have then realized that her grandfather was Ahithophel, this wise advisor who came through his wisdom by praying to God. In fact, this was that pretty young girl Bathsheba who had been given in marriage to David's close friend Uriah the Hittite. So what in the world was David thinking when he sent for Bathsheba? But he did. It must have seemed at least somewhat out of the ordinary to her household as well, because houses were seldom, if ever, inhabited by only one family. Now, of course, Uriah the Hittite had most likely set out as a young mercenary soldier, and so he would not have probably had a family home. However, he certainly would have had servants, so there was a household for Bathsheba to live in, with people all around. And because King David sent messengers, these would have been recognized as having come from the palace and may very well have worn at least ceremonial arms. So all those living nearby would have certainly noticed this entourage coming to the house of Uriah. I imagine they would have been curious, even more curious to see Bathsheba leave with that entourage, because Bathsheba did certainly have to come. It was a summons from the king. The king had ultimate authority, so a summons was not an invitation. Now to get the sense of it, let's read how this played out. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. Not much romance there, is it? A young and lonely bride, compromised during her private observation of a necessary religious rite. What a mix of ambivalent emotions she must have felt when she got a summons to David's palace. Sin is complicated. It's insidious. We end up being agents, making those bad, wrong decisions, but so, so often we also end up becoming victims of circumstances that riot out of control. And when I say agent, I mean an agent of sin. We bring it with our choices. But even in bringing sin in, we become victims of sin too. Sin is a sticky, complicated trap of corruption and death. Sin kicks you in the teeth while you're down. Even the innocent get dragged into the mess. Because in all that time, Bathsheba had been with her husband Uriah. No baby came. But now, after one night with David, she got pregnant. And she knew it was David's baby. Because she had gone into him at just exactly the wrong timing in her monthly cycle. What follows is a sad and sickening tale of lies, manipulation, and a murder. What a shocking, heartbreaking end to a private, scripturally based bath in her own home. One loss after another came as Bathsheba mourned the death of her husband, the loss of her home, and the life she had had as a young and much loved bride. Her hopes and dreams were crushed her good name in disgrace, cut off from family and friends, and now sequestered in the palace, just one of a growing number of wives in the king's harem. Even her pregnancy, usually the source of great pride and joy, was the cause of deep sorrow, for she had been taken as an object of the king's lust, rather than as the cherished beloved of her own husband. And there was more tragedy to come because Bathsheba's first sweet little baby would soon die after he was born. Luis Palau once wrote a book entitled, Where is God When Bad Things Happen? And I have read and reread that book dozens of times. Even now, as I look through the chapter headings, I see Bathsheba. When your child dies, when you've lost your spouse, when your life is irreversibly changed by tragedy in the blink of an eye, when you've been violated. How do you keep going on? And how do we cope with the issues of God's sovereignty and God's love? Well, 
One message you and I get loud and clear is that sin's consequences are painful, and like a ripple effect, it sends shockwaves of pain ever farther out over time and geography, even to magnifying the suffering to the guilty and the innocent alike. How do we know that Bathsheba was innocent, an innocent victim of David's sin? Because the prophet Nathan, a year later, came back to David, and the image that he gave David was of a rapacious and greedy man stealing the innocent lamb from his neighbor who only had that lamb. And who is the lamb? Bathsheba. There was nothing in Bathsheba that invited David's sin. It all began in his own heart and in the atmosphere of sexual sin that David had previously brought into his own home through his own wrong choices by adding wife after wife, and then concubine after concubine in direct disregard to God's warning to kings. And here it is. And he, the king, must not acquire many wives for himself. Or what? Or else his heart will turn away. With his first transgression, David began the domino effect, and innocent people would be traumatized in the process. Now that's something you and I have got to get clear about sin. At its core, sin is like radioactive material, an invisible, disrupting, corrosive force that has the whole of creation in its grip. It makes everything broken and ruined, and what's broken hurts the guilty and the innocent alike. Sin may offer temporary satisfaction, but it always brings lasting destruction. Rape deeply wounds the body, the soul, and the spirit, and Bathsheba would never be the same. Even David, though he was the Lord's anointed, and at his core, a man after God's own heart, had deeply corrupted himself by what he thought would please him, because it led him ever deeper into the murky darkness of betrayal and murder. But then there's God. Without God, that's the whole horrifying story. Sin, suffering, corruption, death. But incredibly, the anguish and misery of sin's tragic consequences are never beyond God. God's mercy, God's redeeming love, and God's incomprehensibly mighty and ruling power over what happens next. You know, in a way, I dreaded teaching on this story because I resonate so deeply with it. I know what it's like to be violated. I have felt that crushing shame and that self-loathing and that scalding pain. And where was God when this was happening to me? So we ask, where is God when someone is raped? If God loves me, then why did he allow me to be victimized? And what about King David? It would be so convenient to just write him off as pure evil. But life is more complicated than that. David did something unspeakably wrong. Yet God loved David too. And it grieved God that sin crouching at David's door eventually devoured him whole. And why? Why would God permit evil if God is good? Where is God's power and God's love? So another thing that really stands out about God and Bathsheba's story is that when God is permitting sin, that is not God's permission to sin. God never gives God's moral approval of sin. God is not surprised by evil. And God does not approve of evil. But God has decreed that people exercise their ability to make moral choices, to choose between good and and evil. And evil is on you and me. Without God, there is no escape from our own choices. But the Bible strongly teaches that through Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and through Jesus' healing power, you and I do not have to live in bondage to the past, to the awful suffering and memories of being a victim or being an agent. God often does not prevent disaster. But God does promise to be constantly with us if we will have God. 
God does promise to help us survive, to show us the way out and bring recovery and healing. I can tell you from my own life, it can be a long, slow, hard process. Healing does not happen alone. Healing comes through the whole body of Christ being embraced and built up by wise, spirit-filled pastoring and counseling. And in fact, I think this is just what God did for Bathsheba. Because remember who else was in David's harem by that point? Abigail. Abigail knew what it was like to be crushed down by a, a mean man. She knew what it was like to be raked over the coals, to live with hopes and dreams, uh, trashed to the ground. I think Abigail even knew what it was to be violated. And she took this grieving young Bathsheba into her circle to mother her and mentor her. That's what I think. And there is good news for those who have done wrong as well, because as often as you and I have been hurt by others' wrong choices, we have done our share of hurting other people and doing wrong ourselves. But you and I do not have to stay in bondage to the wrong things we've chosen and that we've done and said. Now, often, you and I might try to hide the truths from ourselves because we can't stand to think that we're really capable of something base and wrong. What might we have been trying to hide from ourselves? In what ways might we have been trying to cover our bases? Is there something that we might have done or said or have been secretly cherishing that we know is wrong or that's been making us feel bad inside? Our relationship with Jesus is going to determine how we handle the realization of our own guilt. Now here are two dead ends. The first is remorse. The second is penance. Now Remorse may feel like repentance, and doing penance may feel like repentance, but without actually repenting, remorse and penance go nowhere. See, repentance means you radically, profoundly change by turning away from the old and entering into the new. Remorse and penance are just attempts to pay for the sin emotionally and materially without in any way really changing how we think or how we live or what we do. After a while, when we've been remorseful long enough or we've done enough penance, we just go back to our old familiar ways, which makes it very likely you and I will do the same thing again in the future. Distress that drives us to God turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We can repent of those things and come to God for forgiveness and restoration. We will never regret that kind of pain. But those who let distress drive them away from God to remorse, into penance, end up full of regrets. Now, we could pause right now and ask ourselves what circumstances seem to be out of control, where you and I were just re reacting, maybe out of emotion or maybe out of stress. When things seem out of control, you and I can always turn to Jesus, even in the moment. Jesus will give us what you and I need, the ability to handle what's happening, what's coming our way. Even in the middle of a crisis, it's actually not too late to take a minute to pray. Now, you would think that this broken young woman was crushed for good, that her circumstances flattened her she'd never get back up again. But that's not what happened. The Lord did not forget Bathsheba, and the Lord did not leave her to molder away in obscurity. As you follow her story, you find out she became David's most influential wife. And through her, Israel's next king was born, celebrated for his wisdom. Solomon set a throne for his mother Bathsheba right beside his own throne on the royal dais. And prophets and princes came to her for counsel. Ultimately, God honored both Uriah and Bathsheba in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I can learn from Bathsheba that tragic circumstances, wrong decisions, even the heaviness of really tragic, awful things, the shame, the guilt, the grief, don't get the last say in our story. God gets the last say. God redeems and restores life stories. God redeems us not only from our own mess, 
but from the messes other people dump on us. Not only that, God has the ability to restore what was damaged and to clean what was filthied. God is so emphatic about this that God says once you belong to God, no one can condemn you. No one. Even you cannot condemn you. God has written every line of your story and my story, even the really hard parts, the parts you and I hope no one will ever know about. As Proverbs 4, verse 7 says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. And this is often the cost of wisdom, learning through our pain, through our suffering, through our grief, through our coming to the end of ourselves and discovering that God is even there, actually waiting there for you and I to put our trust in God, to put our faith in God, and to follow God. Oh God, thank you for Bathsheba's story, and thank you for how you've revealed yourself in her story as loving, as a caring father who knows that the horrifying things will happen. You have the power to make even what's awful into good. And so we thank you and we pray this to the praise of your grace.